Uh, yes, good morning and good afternoon, colleagues. This is Susan Casey from Africa CDC. Uh, welcome to Africa CDC ICANN webinar on infection prevention and control. Uh, this is the fourth week of series four. We are going to talk about tuberculosis and COVID-19 intersection, as well as the IPC aspect of it. We also have a country presentation from Ethiopia talking about the Ethiopia experience in tuberculosis and COVID-19. Before we start, I would like to remind you all uh, to mute your mics and videos, um, to remind you that to post all your questions in the question and answers chat box and, and all the questions will be answered at the end of the presentations. Also, I would like to remind you all that we no longer use the social app to for certificates, rather we offer certificates at the end of the series. Um, the series has six weeks and you have to attend more than four weeks for you to receive a certificate. And also you have to attend, um, the web, the session is one, the session is one hour and a half and you have to attend more than one hour for you to also receive the certificate. Um, to start, we are going to invite um, Rajabu Bigirimana from Africa CDC. He works in the Division of Emergence, Pre Emergence Preparation and Response to give us the epidemiological situation as of this morning. Dr. Rajabu, over to you. Please share the screen from your side. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, uh, colleagues. Um, thank you uh, so much, Susan, for your introduction and uh, your um, house uh, rules. So I'm going to take you uh, through the uh, AP situation, AP updates. Um, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? Yes, Rajab, we can. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. So uh, globally, um, as of uh, yesterday, uh, 20 October, 2020, uh, we have uh, more than 40 million confirmed cases and uh, more than 1 million deaths with case fatality rate of 2.8 with the Pan-American Health Organization region uh, taking the lead. And, um, uh, concerning cases reported in Africa daily by AU member states, uh, this week, uh, this is the chart uh, as of uh, today. Um, you can see the southern and um, southern region and the northern region are taking the lead in terms of cumulative numbers of COVID-19 cases. And uh, this chart, uh, this uh, slide shows you uh, as of yesterday, we had 7,084 new cases, 259 deaths, and uh, 8,998 recoveries. And with um, uh, uh, Northern Region uh, coming, taking the lead with 3,639, followed by the Southern Region with uh, 1,632. And cumulatively, uh, the northern, re the southern region is taking the lead with 779,982 uh, cases, followed by the northern region. And um, as per countries, you can see here with these slides that uh, 44, uh, 24 countries are reporting less than uh, 5,000 cases, uh, 10 countries between uh, 5,000 and 10,000 cases, uh, 15 countries between uh, 10,000 to 50,000 cases, and five uh, countries uh, between 50,000 uh, uh, to 500 cases. And only one country is reporting less than 500,000 uh, cases. And uh, this one shows uh, we have one country that's 
it's not reporting, uh, which is Tanzania. And um, uh, five countries are reporting between uh, less than 10 cases per uh, 100,000 population and uh, 29 countries uh, between 10 to 100 cases per uh, 100,000 population and uh, 16 countries between 100 and 500 cases per 100,000 population and only four countries are reporting less than 500 cases per 100,000 population. So in terms of uh, testing capacities, so as of today, we have um, um, cumulatively more than 17 million tests conducted so far in the whole continent uh, with 10.4 uh, tests per case ratio uh, with positivity rate of 9.6%. Uh, uh, oh, so those are uh, AP updates as of uh, today. Uh, thank you so much for your listening. Thank you. Over to you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Rajabu, for the updates. Uh, to remind you that if you have any question, please put it in the Q&A chat box um, and we will answer all these questions. Either we'll answer them um, on the chat box or we'll answer them live at the end of the presentations. Now I would like to welcome Dr. Karen Brittany. Uh, she's currently working as a technical advisor, infection prevention and control at Resolve to Save Lives. She has a degree in history from Yale University. She's also a medical doctor and she obtained her medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians. She has more than 30 years experience in the area of TB, HIV, AIDS, and she has published numerous articles in those areas. Please, Dr. Karen, share the screen from your side. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, can you see it? No. Can you see it? Yes, we can see it now. Yes, we can see it. But can you make it full screen, please? I can try. <laughs> How's that? Hello? Hello? Sorry, we can hear you. Um, if you go at the bottom right, uh, before this, yes, there. No, uh, the one that says slideshow. At the bottom, yes. No, no, yes. come down. Okay. Further down. Next. Next. The next. Yeah, yeah. That one. Yeah. Click that. <laughs> Hello. Now it's okay, but we cannot hear you. Hi, Karen. I think we lost Karen.
hi Karen, if it's okay, I can share the screen from my side and you can just present and just tell me next. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can yeah hear I can hear you now. Okay, let's try again. Can you see it? Yes. All right. I and you can just make it. Yeah, I don't know whether I want to make it full screen. It seems to have screwed up the audio when I did it. Uh, uh, maybe try it again. You know, we're tracing a number of things. All right. No, not that one. That, the wrong, that was the wrong thing. Yeah, that one. All right, let's hope I don't go off again. Can you hear me? Perfect. Okay, finally. Sorry about that. Um, the developing world back here in Brooklyn. Okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about tuberculosis and COVID-19 today. Um, I am, uh, as Lizzie mentioned, passionate about TB and the risk of delay in diagnosis and treatment uh, because of COVID has become very apparent um, and there is significant IPC overlap. So the outline of the presentation is that I'm going to go through TB diagnostic and treatment delays during COVID. I'm gonna go quickly through TB epidemiology. Um, WHO just came out with the 2020 report on global TB. <clears throat> I'm going to quickly review TB pathophysiology, including HIV and their intersection because this is critical to understanding um, a big part of the success there's been in the last 15 years in bringing down TB. Uh, and then I'm gonna go through TBIPC and airborne infection control, since this seems to be a controversial issue that will not go away vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about healthcare worker infections, which is something else I'm quite passionate about. So why are we talking about TB? Well, in June, a WHO modeling estimate suggested if the COVID-19 pandemic led to a reduction of 25% in expected TB detection over a three month period, there would be a 13% increase in TB deaths. This would bring TB mortality back to levels from five years ago. Estimates suggested that between 2020 and 2025, an additional 1.4 million TB deaths could be registered as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, the, this is a set of curves that was published in the new WHO report. It's a bit confusing when you first look at it. It, it, it just came out last week. Uh, and it's basically balancing a few variables. Um, the duration of the decrease in diagnostics, which you see on the left hand, the decrease in case detection rate as a percentage of the total that was detected last year. And then on the right hand, you see the uh, excess TB deaths in millions. So if you take for example, um, the curve at the bottom, supposing the number of people with TB detected were to fall by 25 to 50% over three months, which unfortunately is plausible based on data from several of the high burden countries. This will lead to 200,000 to 400,000 excess deaths just this year. If there were 200,000 excess TB deaths, the world would be back to 2015. And then if there were 400,000, we'd be back to 2012. So this is quite ominous. Um, I, I don't want to dwell on these curves because, you know, models are models and curves are curves. But this is in the Global TB Report, which you can obviously download from the WHO website. And I would strongly urge you to do so 
um, if you wanna think about this long range. Now I'm gonna go through some slides about Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe back in April, um, their ministry in fact recognized there was an issue and that there were key risks for TB service delivery. Um, they recognized the similarity in the clinical presentation between COVID-19 and TB, which would increase the chances of misdiagnosis. They recognized um, TB testing capacity could be negatively affected because molecular testing programs are being used to test for SARS-CoV-2. Of course, already by April, we had global supply of TB health commodities, meaning medicines and diagnostic stuff, driven by activities in China and India, likely to be reduced during the response, which is of course exactly what happened. So their national TB program in con conjunction with partners and the rest of the ministry uh, did a rapid assessment. And the aim to identify Zimbabwe's TB service delivery gaps um, from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the TB and leprosy commissioners and nursing officers were contacted telephonically for information gathering. The COVID-19 task force conducted a review of the global literature and guidance on the COVID-19 response to the Lyme EMTC strategy with healthcare service delivery priorities. They did a reassessment of TB programming strengths and weaknesses since the onset of COVID. And they looked at opportunities for continuity and program integration in order to strengthen. And here are the challenges and the adaptation strategies that they <clears throat> adopted. And I think it's important to look at this a little bit in detail because Zimbabwe did it and presented this at a union conference, International Union Against TB in July. And uh, Marita Dlublo kindly shared these slides, which I've adapted a bit. Um, and they really have done a fantastic job. And again, I think it's very important for others to start looking in the same way if they haven't already. So they noticed, of course, they had inadequate resources, human financial fuel the TV activities um, as soon as Karen, your voice is fading away. Uh, what should I do? Let's see. Can you hear me now? Any so, better? Uh, much better. Very loud. So however okay. you're doing it, keep it this way. Yes. Okay. Should I go back or did you, could you hear me? Maybe at the beginning of this slide, just start this slide again. Okay. So basically they recognize that the possibility for inadequate resources both, you know, including human resources, financial resources, and fuel for their TB activities were going to be prioritized for COVID-19 activities. Um, so the MOH plan to decentralize PCR testing from five laboratories to 13 um, at the provincial level to increase access to COVID-19 testing in order to detect early and hoping to prevent spread. Then they had a delay in receipt of COVID-19 cartridges anticipated because of course, as we know, all flights were grounded and nothing could get in or out. Um, and so the COVID-19 strategy recommended using additional testing platforms such as gene expert machines, rapid diagnostic tests for screening and a couple of mobile PCR testing labs. Um, COVID-19 testing was gonna be prioritized over TB and this was obviously gonna be a problem. And they tried to mobilize additional gene expert machines and staff in order to support um, additional numbers. Um, within community TB care, reduce TB screening and treatment support activities at the community level by community health workers due to the ongoing movement restrictions. I know many, many countries in lockdown, people couldn't get around. So they began providing TB patients with much, much longer periods of medications and we're gonna have to do self-administered therapy or use um, community directly observed therapy with 
family members, suboptimal, but better than not having medicines at all. Um, there were huge knowledge gaps among community health workers on COVID-19. So they conducted re reorientation meetings at the health facility level for community health workers on both TB and COVID-19, really to revamp uh, community TB case finding. There was limited ability of PPE for community health workers to enable them to continue with their community uh, TB duties. So they provided PPE for community health workers and basically increased DOT and self-administered treatment through counseling patients and family uh, to re-emphasize the importance of treatment adherence with TB medications. Um, they anticipated that there'd be limited implementation of community TB activities by civil society and CBOs. So they provided guidance and support on the safe continu continuation of community TB care activities. So all of this was quite detailed and time consuming, but the attempt obviously uh, was to maintain essential services in tuberculosis. Um, now I seem to be having problems advancing my slide. Is there any way you can do it? Can you still hear me? Have yes, I yes, yes. We can hear you very well. You're very clear. Okay, here we go. Um, so this is unfortunately uh, what has happened. This came out, I believe, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases or someplace in the last three weeks from Nigeria. And this is a one institution, okay? And it's a comparison between the number of specimens collected for TB case and cases diagnosed in the first and second quarters of 2019 and 2020. And the suspected or presumptive TB cases are in the dark bars. And you can see that um, by April, May of this year, uh, the numbers had gone down dramatically. Very, very, very ominous. And of course, the confirmed TB cases in the lighter shaded bars also had gone down quite dramatically. So this is already data. Um, in real time and it's extremely worrisome. And this is also in the WHO monthly uh, annual report that came out last week, showing the trends in monthly notifications of tuberculosis this year. And as you can see, um, there are fairly serious drops uh, in most of the high burden African countries. And again, if you remember that early curve model that I showed you, uh, this suggests that there's gonna be quite a number of excess TB related deaths. So just to review, uh, why is TB diagnosis down? People with mild symptoms or more chronic symptoms have been discouraged from seeking care to avoid crowding in healthcare facilities. This has been a policy, you know, in many, many, many countries and was a policy here during the major league upsurge in New York. If you're not really, really sick, don't go in. So that's a problem. The number of healthcare facilities offering TB diagnostics and treatment been severely reduced, as I mentioned, with diversion of human resources. The TB staff and molecular diagnostic platforms like gene expert machines have been reallocated for COVID-19 testing understandable, but not necessarily very wise in the long term. Um, there's been a disruption of procurement of laboratory consumables. And of course, restrictions of movement, lockdowns, loss of wages have made it very difficult for people to travel to health facilities. And then there's the age old problem of stigma, given the similarities and clinical features between TB and COVID, such as fever and cough, uh, patients don't want to admit that they have any of these symptoms, so they're avoiding uh, coming forth to get diagnosed. 
So epidemiologically, just for those of you who are not TB fanatics as I am, there really has been a slow decrease in TB since 2006. Remember that M tuberculosis infects a quarter of the world's population, which is 2 billion people. And there were 10 million incident cases in 2019. Only 7.1 million were actually notified to WHO, which means we're missing a lot. Uh, there were an estimated 1.2 million TB deaths in HIV negative people in 2019, which was a 27% decline um, over 20 years. And there were 208,000 TB deaths in HIV positive people, which was a 60% decline, which gives you a sense, and I'm about to get into this, of how important HIV treatment has been uh, in bringing tuberculosis down. So HIV TB are a deadly combination. Uh, tuberculosis is the leading cause of death in people with HIV in Africa. One in four people with HIV die because of TB. Um, there were 862,000 HIV infected TB patients globally in 2019 of whom nearly three quarters lived in sub-Saharan Africa. So the risk of developing TB for the 38 million people infected with HIV is 18 times higher than the risk for the general population. And here are the incidence rates uh, for 2019. And you can see um, TB incidence rates are calculated per 100,000 population per year. You can see in the dark blue down here, um, we have South Africa, including Lestufu, um, and then that's greater than 500 per 100,000. And then in the second highest category, 300 to 500 per 100,000, almost all of the rest of, or considerable part of Sub-Saharan Africa. So again, you can find these maps um, in the global, WHO global, TB report. And this is the estimated HIV prevalence in TB cases. And once again, you can see um, that this, this part of the world is pretty heavily affected uh, by HIV and tuberculosis together. Now, why am I dwelling on this? Oh, let me just show you the, the big numbers um, of cases. As you can see, I love TB data. Uh, India, of course, has the most, but India has a huge number of people. So these are the absolute numbers of TB cases as opposed to the rates. Um, so you're going to have obviously bigger numbers in Asia because there are more people. So reviewing transmission and infection with TB, um, just remember that the lungs are the entry portal and that you have to inhale these droplet nuclei and that transmission occurs, um, and this data is both old and it's been renewed contemporaneously. There isn't really too much doubt about it. Uh, when you cough, you, you expel up to 3000 droplet nuclei each time you cough. Uh, even if you talk for five minutes and you have TB in your lungs, you can aerosolize. And sneezing, unfortunately, turns out to be one of the most efficient ways of spreading TB. So enhancement of transmission depends on the inoculum size. And if you have cavitary lesions, meaning holes in your lungs full of TB bacilli uh, in a coughing patient, those are gonna be the most infectious. There's also strain variability in virulence. There have been outbreaks from an index case in a non-HIV setting that infected everybody there at a particularly virulent strain. And then super effective aerosolization, like autopsy suite transmissions. Obviously, if you saw through the chest wall cavity of somebody that you didn't know had TB, you're going to aerosolize gazillions of bacilli. Um, and ventilation is really critical, uh, or the lack thereof, um, because the TB bacillus, unfortunately, can live long, up to two to three days in the air and remain infectious. Therefore, uh, ventilation is absolutely key to diminishing transmission. Uh, in terms of risk, there are variations in setting, occupational group, 
obviously healthcare workers, but minors as well. The local prevalence of tuberculosis, the patient population, and of course, the effectiveness of TB infection control measures. So before you develop an immune response to TB, um, you inhale these bacilli and they get into your lungs and they reach your alveoli um, where they replicate intracellularly within alveolar macrophages. They're very clever. So <clears throat> they block the uh, killing activity of the phagosome in the macrophage and you don't actually have an immediate host immune response. They then spread the bacilli and you get metastatic foci in your regional nodes. Uh, they seed the blood, they travel to tissues favorable for multiplica multiplication. And then you have a series of um, chemokines and, and um, immune substances uh, which begin to kick in um, and they attract CD4 cells. And I wanna dwell on the CD4 cells because you have to have CD4 cells in order to overcome the initial TB infection. Uh, the CD4 cell then meets the antigen. It's presented by the macrophage and the CD4 cells get transformed. And basically these proliferate, they produce clones and that's when you get your positive TB test. And essentially uh, you have a big enough population of these CD4 cells that re reacts to the tuberculin, either the skin test or the antigen in the blood test. Um, and essentially, uh, it is extremely important to remember that neither of these tests is reliable to detect latent TB infection in patients with advanced AIDS. So we learned this the hard way with rapid progression from TB infection to disease in adults. Uh, in the immunocompromised AIDS wards and homeless shelters in New York City in the 1980s and 90s. And then the exact same thing happened in South Africa uh, with the notable outbreak of multidrug resistant TB in 2006 in Tugela Freire. And the problem is that the X-ray will be atypical, so you can't necessarily figure out that the patient has TB. It's difficult to diagnose. And the time from exposure to TB to developing active disease is very, very fast, three to six weeks. Um, what happens is you have no overwhelming, no immunologic control of the bacillus when you have advanced AIDS because you don't have any T cells. So you don't go through this complicated cascade and you get what that slide shows um, this is overwhelming TB. This came from a patient autopsy in New York. And um, you can see these red things are all TB bacilli. And if you have a multidrug resistance strain that gets into the mix as they did in New York City and also in multiple outbreaks in South Africa in AIDS clinics, um, then you get death of everybody. So this is obviously horrible. So what can we do about this? Well, you, you wanna diagnose accurately, so you have to take a history, but systemic symptoms for TB are nonspecific, fever, night sweats, weight loss, suggesting a chronic illness. COVID-19 symptoms are more acute and of shorter duration. The cough can be productive or dry. Most patients cough, but they might not have noticed could be denial, they might not have noticed. And the COVID-19 cough is not necessarily different from the TB cough. And just remember, as a, as a clinician for 30 years, I know, and I'm sure many of you know, patients cannot always accurately recall exactly how long they've had their symptoms. So to say to somebody, are you sure you've only been coughing for two weeks, must be COVID, or maybe you've been coughing for a month, that's probably TB, that's, that's really not gonna work. Uh, you also have to remember that patients are frightened of being diagnosed with either of these diseases, okay? The stigma of diagnosis of either TB or COVID-19 is real. People are afraid. People are in denial. We all know that as healthcare workers, how many times have we gone to work when we were ill and shouldn't have been there? Uh, and then most importantly, what we often forget, um, 
we as, as healthcare providers think that health is number one, but you know, everybody else has a life and the other activities of daily living are actually more important. So obtaining food, getting to work, taking care of your children uh, really will preclude your going straight to a healthcare facility if you're not feeling well. In addition to the cough and fever, the loss of taste or smell and the sore throat aches and fatigue are indeed more characteristics of, characteristic of COVID-19, not of TB, but TB can cause fatigue. Patients may have difficulty describing their symptoms clearly. And, you know, shortness of breath and rapid respiratory rate definitely points to COVID-19 and an abnormal O2 sat less than 93 points to COVID-19, but that's assuming uh, your facility has access to a pulse oximeter, which at the primary healthcare level is frequently not the case. And it's assuming that you have adequate trained healthcare staff that can actually spend the time talking to the patient and eliciting all of this information. As I mentioned, um, chest x-rays can be a bit problematic although in general, they're more sensitive than sputum for detecting TB uh, and the findings in TB differ from COVID on a chest X-ray, but they're often not available at the PHC level. And remember, if you have AIDS uh, and active TB, you can have an atypical chest X-ray, you can have a normal chest X-ray. All those abnormalities that you get with TB are dependent on your having a normal T4 count um, and COVID-19 patients may have a normal X-ray. So X-ray is not gonna solve the problem. Um, these recommendations from WHO uh, came out in June. Many countries might be sharing molecular platforms and basically um, diverting expert machines completely from tuberculosis. I know that from colleagues in Mozambique, this is happening there. Um, Maintaining current molecular diagnostic services for tuberculosis is crucial. Do not move equipment from currently designated TB labs to respond to the demand for COVID-19 testing. And in areas with high TB incidence, test for both COVID and TB. And these were WHO recommendations way back in June. They understood at WHO exactly what was gonna happen. Um, airborne infection control, which we've often avoided talking about with COVID-19, um, basically just, just to remind people, um, it, its aim is to ensure the protection of those who might be vulnerable to acquiring infection in the general community while receiving care due to health problems in a range of settings. So I wanna emphasize here um, the importance of the WHO hierarchy of IPC, administrative controls, environmental controls, and PPE at the end. Administrative controls really are the most important. They're also generally speaking, the least expensive, but they do require willpower, managerial buy-in and support. Early screening of patients, separating coffers from non-coffers, promoting cough etiquette and cough signage, fast tracking patients with cough to a care provider, and ensuring that your health facility design, construction, or renovation is conducive for TB infection control, as well as COVID, influenza, and all respiratory pathogens. Let's not get into whether this is contact, whether this is droplet, whether this is airborne, it's the same issue. You want to promote, promote occupational health measures for the staff, meaning screening, and I'm going to come back to that uh, at the end. And you certainly want to ensure monitoring and evaluation. So this is early screening and registration. You don't get to go into the facility if you have a cough. And somebody is there um, asking you uh, whether you are, in fact, having these kind of symptoms and Obviously the person needs to be trained so that they don't insult the patient, so that the patient is forthcoming. And then you can figure out where the patients with cough or other symptoms um, should be waiting. This is a typical waiting room. Um, I did take this picture. Don't allow waiting room crowding. 
too many people, too close together, indoors, as you can see, uh, this is called a dropped ceiling. Very, very, very bad idea. We'll get back to that in a second. Uh, and there's obviously no ventilation in here. So you want to separate the coffers. And again, in a friendly, discreet way, so they don't feel stigmatized and insulted. This is a question of training the healthcare staff. Most healthcare staff care about their patients. That's why they went into healthcare. So this is not really that complicated a message to deliver. You then want to fast track the patient to a care provider. Obviously, if you can give the patient a mask, fantastic. Uh, many places you can't, uh, but the main point is to get the patient seen. Uh, this is not a perfectly ventilated office space, but all the windows are 100% open, which is essential. Uh, you want to train the staff and patients on cough etiquette. These are all posters left from, you know, from TB. They're equally applicable to COVID. Um, they were funded by PEPFAR, by the Global Fund. Um, I have strongly urged repeatedly that we try and find out where all these posters are and make sure they get redeployed and reposted. This is cover your cough or sneeze, as you can say. It says stop the spread of TB, colds, and influenza. Uh, of course, now we could also add COVID. And you can see all the things that we've been talking about forever and ever since COVID started. Um, cover your, your cough with your elbow or with a tissue, which you then throw away, and then wash your hands. So none of this is new. And we just have to repeat it over and over again. You want to make sure that your staff is, is trained. Absolutely key. And then we have environmental controls. And to me, these are absolutely critical. And they address the issue of is COVID uh, droplet or airborne? It doesn't matter if your environmental controls are in place. So these are, again, photos from various countries in Africa. You can see that this was built, I, I will say, many of the countries in the Southern Cone um, have better outdoor waiting and triage facilities because they're more tuned into tuberculosis because of the devastation that was created by HIV, um, which ramped up the TB rates. So these are fenestrated bricks, which allow air circulation and a certain amount of privacy. This is a much quicker, easier, cheaper kind of outdoor construct. Um, this is the cheapest that there is, but it's completely effective and it's going to decrease transmission. Um, and as you can see, uh, many places have put, put into effect um, outdoor screening, outdoor triage, outdoor waiting areas with very, inexpensive uh, protection from the sun and the rain. This is again, natural ventilation. Um, this obviously we would prefer not to have quite so much crowding. Um, we've advocated that for bench seating, you try to put X's where people uh, may sit so that they don't crowd. Um, this is easier said than done. I'm perfectly well aware of that, but we have to keep trying. So you wanna promote natural ventilation. Um, if you use mixed ventilation, meaning mechanical, meaning air conditioning, um, that's unavoidable, it gets hot, people wanna be comfortable, uh, but you have to remember air conditioning is not ventilation, okay? It's not doing anything to circulate the air, it's not helping you. And so you wanna make certain uh, that the densely populated areas in your clinic are outdoors, whether that's the queue at pharmacy, whether it's the waiting area, above all, uh, triage before patients enter. As I mentioned before, you want to avoid drop ceilings. Should you go rip them out? Well, that depends on your budget and how much of a, of a challenge it'll be to do that. Drop ceilings cut down volume um, so that you're reducing airflow, which is key to avoiding 
transmission of any of these pathogens. And draft ceilings can't be ventilated by whirly birds placed on the roof, which I will show you in a second. Um, and you want to avoid all windows that open sideways or up and down. If you have those kind of windows, you've cut 50% of your airflow. So do you go and take all those windows out? That's pretty expensive. But as you think about designing new spaces, don't put in those kinds of windows. You want windows on hinges that open 100% and allow 100% of the opening to permit air to come in and out. This is a whirly bird. Um, it's quite inexpensive and you put it on your rooftop of your healthcare facility. Uh, you can put several. And when the wind blows, it turns and it sucks air out of the space below it. Um, however, you know, going back to the dropped ceiling, if underneath the roof you have a dropped ceiling, then the whirly bird is going to ventilate the dead space between the roof and the dropped ceiling and is gonna do nothing for the airflow in your clinic. So this is why um, in infection control in TB, we are allergic to dropped ceilings. Um, it obviously depends on the wind speed. As you can see, um, if you're going, if the wind is going at 15 kilometers per hour, you're gonna get this 1500 meters cubed uh, airflow rate, whereas if the wind picks up, obviously your airflow rate is going to pick up. Um, so if the clinic is in a completely unwindy area, this is probably not going to be as effective. Uh, nevertheless, as I mentioned, it's quite inexpensive and quite easy to install. Again, um, for inpatient design, uh, you want to make sure that you pay attention when you're building spaces um, to making it maintainable and sustainable, to spacing the beds, uh, preferably two meters apart, to having windows that open, uh, multiple windows, and somebody has to keep the windows open. When you do your construction, you're gonna need an overhang here because in the rainy season, you don't want rain coming in. The patients obviously are not gonna to wanna to get wet. Um, so, Building location and orientation, building form and dimensions, the window types and operation, all your other openings, construction methods and detailing, external elements like walls, screens, etc. And obviously, I'm well aware that within cities, you've got extremely difficult urban planning conditions, but these are things you want to think about. Um, when you're designing your healthcare facilities or trying to renovate them. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is PPE. Um, as I mentioned, in infection control for tuberculosis, for COVID, for anything, PPE is important, but it's not as important as the things that I've just been discussing. So surgical masks can be wear worn by patients if they're coughing if you happen to have them, um, and if the cough can't be contained with a cloth or a tissue. And in most situations for COVID-19, surgical masks can indeed be worn. Your eye protection, which is not shown in this photograph, is key for COVID-19 uh, because it is droplet transmitted and you wanna protect your eyes. N95 or FF2 respirators um, are worn by healthcare workers in high risk settings, okay? So for TB, this would be MDR TB wards. For COVID-19, this would be if you were ventilating or intubating somebody um, and or performing bronchoscopy or any other thing that would aerosolize, okay? In theory, these must be fit tested. Um, these, are, these are very simple tests, but they're often not performed, uh, especially at uh, lower level healthcare facilities. Um, but the N95 or respirator only fulfills its function if it fits properly. Okay, now I'm gonna move on and this will be my last section uh, to talk about occupational health because it is so important. Occupational health 
is really the responsibility of administrative controls. Um, for tuberculosis, it is key that the staff receive an annual evaluation for TB, and frankly, this should be mandatory. I've been working in multiple countries in Africa on this issue for five years. It's very problematic to establish. Healthcare workers are squeamish about being screened in their own facility. Um, basically, for them to have the ability to go get screened somewhere else is logistically problematic. Uh, nevertheless, this is something that absolutely should be done. Um, and essentially, that's going to be a policy issue for your various ministries. I can't stress this enough. I'll show you the data in a second. For COVID-19, you should consider staff screening for symptoms daily. Um, essentially, how your ministry recommends doing that is going to be individualized. But it's tremendously important that staff be screened for obvious reasons. And remember, all of this is to protect the healthcare workers. This is my primary concern. If you don't have functioning, healthy healthcare workers, you don't have a healthcare system. And I know this from my own experience, uh, having been on the front lines in the early days of AIDS, there was no hepatitis B vaccine in those days. And um, I did contract hepatitis B from a needle stick because there were no gloves. So, and the institution I worked for couldn't have cared less. So it's really, really important for us to protect our healthcare workers and the screening process should incorporate their buy-in so they understand it's for their own good. It's not disciplinary, it's not policing, it's not supervisory, it's to keep them healthy. Um, staff should be offered confidential HIV tests. Um, certainly in the days of when I worked in the AIDS clinic in New York, I strongly urged people to get their HIV test elsewhere because HIV uh, confidentiality did not seem to me likely to be maintained. Uh, one would hope that things have advanced. Remember, this was 30 years ago uh, when HIV was a fatal disease 100% of the time. So I'm hoping that staff is better trained um, in African countries to be able to offer confidential HIV tests. Um, treatment for TB and HIV, of course, should be free. And if staff members found to be HIV infected, they should be allowed to be reassigned to a lower risk area um, if they're working on a TB ward. And I know from my work uh, in the last five years in African countries, staff, healthcare worker staff still die of AIDS related TB. And this really shouldn't be happening in this, at this point. A confidential log of staff diagnosed with TB should be maintained in a locked cabinet and somebody trustworthy should be maintaining this. Um, the purpose of this is to epidemiologically keep track surveillance of how many healthcare workers are coming down with TB in your facility and also to make certain um, of course that the healthcare worker who has TB receives complete treatment. So this is global evidence on the risk of tuberculosis in healthcare workers. Um, in low and medium burden countries, it's 2.4 times the rate of, of the disease in the community. Um, obviously this reflects the fact that TB is so pre prevalent uh, in these countries. So staff, it's always tricky. Did a staff member get TB on the job or did they get it in the community? Doesn't matter their rate's still higher. Um, in high burden countries, uh, it's even higher relative to the community, but that's because, it, among healthcare workers, that's because we have less TB in high burden countries. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. In high burden countries, it's worse um, because basically the likelihood that healthcare workers are gonna take care of somebody with TB in the hospital uh, is much higher. The rate of MDR TB in healthcare workers is 5.5 times uh, the rate of, of MDR admission. And in, in terms of the general population, this is clearly transmission within the healthcare facility. 
Um, and of course, there are increased rates of latent TB infection in high income countries. Uh, it's 10 times the risk. And in lower income countries, uh, it's, it's still much higher, six times the risk, but not quite as much higher as it is in high income countries. So we know this, there are hundreds of articles that have documented healthcare worker risk for TB, um, and we absolutely must do our best to try and prevent it. I've referred to the nosocomial TB outbreaks of multidrug resistant TB. Uh, in US hospitals between 89 and 92, there were 240 cases, most of whom were HIV infected. 80% of the patients died, but there were many healthcare workers who were infected and also died. And when all of the analysis was done, it became clear that TB infection control measures were identified uh, that had not been implemented, despite the fact that the policies existed. Uh, they were sloppy and poorly, intervent, uh, poorly uh, implemented. And the subsequent major funding outlay to reinvigorate TBIC interventions was then associated with the cessation of transmission within the facility. The XDR TB outbreak in Tugela Ferry in South Africa in 2006 was pretty much exactly the same thing. Um, there were 53 initial cases, most of whom had HIV. Um, the mortality was 98% with a median interval from the diagnosis to death of 16 days. Whoops, oh dear, sorry, what did I do? I hit something. Hmm. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, and healthcare workers in Tugela Ferry were infected and died as well from XDR TB. And again, careful analysis, a ton of research, lots of uh, academic medical journal articles published. And what did they discover? That the reason this was happening was the TBIC measures uh, were inadequate. And once they were implemented, um, cases stopped being transmitted. So now I'm looking at H healthcare workers and COVID-19. This is what we know so far. Unfortunately, this is a similar problem. Amnesty International reported that at least 7,000 healthcare workers have died around the world after contracting COVID-19. And this mind you is after a mere six months of this pandemic. Uh, over a thousand workers, healthcare workers in the US died. Uh, in Brazil, 634. In South Africa, 240. In India, 573. Mexico, for unclear reasons, has had the greatest number of healthcare worker deaths, more than 1,300. Uh, healthcare workers are accounting for one in seven of the COVID-19 cases in the world. This is from WHO. That means 14% of COVID-19 cases are among healthcare workers. And this is from just last month. So these figures are disproportionate, obviously. WHO data insofar as it's accurate suggests that healthcare workers represent less than 3% of the population in the majority of countries and less than 2% in almost all low and middle income countries. So we have a huge problem <clears throat> um, with IPC. Uh, it's the same issues that we had this, this graph on the, this picture on the right, on the left shows you uh, another study that came out uh, in lancet.com last month, um, showing you the uh, case per 100,000 healthcare worker rates in the United States and the UK. Um, as you can see, it varies state by state, um, but it's pretty bad. And uh, essentially, uh, the healthcare workers number 
on the bar graph above compared with the um, general community rates per 100,000. So healthcare workers are suffering from this disease as they suffer from TB. And this is directly a reflection of infection prevention and control. And I would say that it is upon us um, to try our very, very best to influence policymakers and ministries um, to do the things that we know uh, work, uh, including the administrative and environmental controls, uh, outdoor triaging, and all the things that I've shown you during this talk. And I think I will stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Karen, for a beautiful presentation and very interesting one. Uh, just to remind everyone, you can post your questions in the Q&A uh, box and the questions will be answered after this presentation. Uh, now I welcome um, Mr. Mola Godef, uh, who is currently working as Infection Prevention and Control Specialist for WHO in Ethiopia. Before joining WHO, he was working as Infection Prevention and Control Program Coordinator at the Ministry of Health Ethiopia for more than six years. Um, he graduated in bachelor degree in environmental health science from Hiramaya University and master's degree in public health and bio statistics and health informatics from Makeo University. Welcome, Mr. Mola Gadif. Kindly share the screen from your side. Hello, colleagues, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. And uh, in general, I would like to thank Africa CDC and ICANN for giving me this opportunity just to share the Ethiopian experience regarding the COVID response as well as the TB. Uh, Accordingly, just uh, my title is mainly focused on the experiences of the COVID response in Ethiopia. And as well, I'll try to say something a little bit about the correlation of COVID-19 response and the TB. Uh, based on that, uh, my presentation outline uh, contains uh, a little bit the background about Ethiopia and the COVID response overview, the role of IPC in the COVID response, and the success so far, the COVID and TB, as well as challenges and the way forward. Uh, as an introduction, uh, you know, uh, Ethiopia is one of the high populated uh, country which has almost 110 of a million population with more than 30,000 healthcare facilities, which most of the healthcare facilities are primary hospitals, I mean, I mean health centers and hospitals, which consists of about 270 primary hospitals, about 324 hour health centers, and more than 70,000 health posters, and about more 273 and more than uh, 90,000 army staffs have been working in the healthcare facility settings. Here, what I would like to mention is that, you know, uh, the number of healthcare facilities and the number of health workforce as related to the population size is a little bit just, we need, we, we need to have to work a lot to accommodate just even that can contribute for the implementation effective uh, IPC practices in healthcare facilities. So if you could, if you could not able to manage the infection prevention, the infection prevention practice at healthcare facilities within this such huge number of healthcare facilities, as well as huge number of health workforce, these healthcare facilities might be the source of infection 
not only for healthcare pharmacists, for or for health workers that have been working at healthcare pharmacies, but also beyond that, even for the community, especially in such uh, pandemics and epidemics, if we could not able to manage or practice the effective infection prevention and control practice, it can accelerate this epidemics like COVID-19, even including like TB transmissions. So in such a very populated uh, high country with high number of healthcare facilities as with high number of health workers, force, I think in effective implementation, IPS has a significant role. So that's why I try to mention here just as an introduction for you. Uh, so far, uh, to the last updated data, Ethiopia has been one of the most highly affected uh, African countries, which is almost about the fifth affected uh, African countries, with a total case of 86 positive COVID cases, uh, total days of 1,277 recoveries out. 37,683, and among the total COVID cases, about 100, I mean, 1,200 cases are health workers. So this is a good indicator that, you know, if most, if uh, several health workers have been infected with COVID-19, I think still this is a good indicator just, just to see how much the the effective implementation of the infection prevention in, re in regard to COVID is critical. So having uh, this uh, data uh, since the WHO declared COVID is the public health emergency, that is a global concern, uh, the, the country have been implementing uh, a lot of measures in general and specifically IPC infection prevention and control is one of the core uh, response uh, strategies. Specifically, we try to uh, redesign the IPC structure under the incident management system. That is, we could develop IPC is the core component of the emergency operation center at the national level, at sub subnational or regional level, and IPC task force at healthcare facilities. Uh, we have been also working uh, in coordinating and planning. That is, we developed uh, a, an EP, EPRP plan, in emergency uh, response plan based on three scenarios. The first scenario, just mainly if uh, imported cases have, could be happen. And the second scenario, if cluster of cases could be happen. And then the third or the worst scenario is that just like, like what we have been facing at this time, just. Uh, high COVID transmission in all the regions. That is what we have been facing now. Uh, we have been also working uh, to engage a lot of stakeholders and partners, uh, engaging of professional societies, specifically uh, IPC is the responsibility and the, that needs the engagement of uh, all professionals. So all these professional societies are very critical and they have been supporting the, the IPC pillar Critically, uh, we have been also working uh, from the beginning um, in terms of capacity building of uh, providing aggressive uh, trainings and uh, orientations for health workers, for uh, for supportive staffs, awareness creation for the community via various channels, IP supplies and equipment distribution to healthcare facilities and updated IPC COVID protocols and guidelines. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, IPC in COVID response is uh, the core component is very critical, specifically for those countries with re resource limited uh, countries. So, so far COVID has neither specific treatment or finally approved vaccine. And now as the number of COVID cases, positive COVID cases, including the asymptomatic cases have been increasing. The number of severe and critical cases has been increasing. So this severe and critical case demands and needs oxygen and ventilator, which might be difficult to, uh, to access and to provide for all these critical and 
severe case. So the most effective intervention or measure here is that effective introduction and implementation of the infection prevention principles and strategies is very important for us, for Ethiopia, and in general for all resource rich countries. So that is why we mainly focus on infection prevention and control as the core response measure for the COVID battle. Uh, the main strategies are just almost more or less they are adopted. They are adapted from the WHO recommendation. We mainly focus on early recognition and triage, implementation of standard precautions and transmission based precautions, administrative measures, environmental and visual controls. Our almost all the protocols, SOPs and guidelines of related to COVID are basically uh, driven from these strategies. So regarding the early recognition and triage, I mentioned earlier that we do have uh, a lot of healthcare facilities. And if the infection prevention and control practice at healthcare, at healthcare facility couldn't be as, as much as, as best as, as possible, this can accelerate even the transmission of the COVID, not only actually but for COVID. We are also, as far as we implement the standard precautions effectively, still we can also reduce the transmission of tuberculosis because, you know, uh, we mainly focus on the, the key strategies and if most effective interventions like hand hygiene, environmental cleaning, physical distancing, appropriate rationalism of TPs. So we are focusing in this end then, but the most important thing here is that uh, availing a very strong triage system at healthcare facilities is very critical just to us to uh, control the, the source of infection from the beginning. So regarding most of the healthcare facilities have established it, uh, a pure triage system, just at least they, they, screen, they screen attendants, at least fever and cough, and then they identified dedicated isolation rooms for the suspected cases. While the suspected cases, they are also expected to initiate for TB screening and testing. Yes, of course, uh, for the last almost six months, we haven't worked a lot in regard to TB, but for the last one, two months, we focused just to, to initiate TB screening and testing for the suspected or confirmed uh, COVID case. Uh, accordingly, once they are screened and tested, the asymptomatic and mild case are guided and consulted to conduct a self home care and those, those confirmed cases are linked with COVID treatment centers. Yes, of course, uh, before two years, when before the number of cases has been reached to the current one, all the COVID case, including the asymptomatic case, were isolated in isolation treatment facilities and those uh, severe and uh, critical cases were in the treatment center. But now, you know, as the number of, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the number of severe and critical cases have been increasing and it's difficult and difficult and sometimes it is not feasible just to make all isolates uh, at facilities. So the Minister of Health has decided at least the critical and severe cases can be isolated at treatment facilities and cared at uh, those dedicated facilities, whereas the mild and asymptomatic cases can be cared or supported and guided at home. Uh, the second most important strategy is that the standard implementation of standard in transmission precaution, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is the most effective one. Uh, where, uh, regarding to COVID cases, where even the asymptomatic cases can transmit the infection, I think effective implementation introduction of standard precautions like hand hygiene, environmental disinfection, is keeping physical distance and calf hygiene are very important, including 
implementation of the limiting of the visitors limits the number of visitors to inpatients, ventilations, aggressive environmental cleaning and disinfection are also important, not only for COVID, but also for TB infection control. The third strategy, what we have been implementing is that administrative uh, measures. Uh, yes, of course, these administrative measures can be implemented at various levels, can be implemented at national level, can be at sub, sub national level and at, at facility level, including at community level. More or less, just I would like to focus here just at healthcare facilities. Now, mandatory hand, hand hygiene practice at healthcare facilities is one of the administrative measures that we have been practicing. Mandatory face mask utilization, restrictions like mask gathering, school closings, hotels, sports, public holidays, conference, and identifying the high risk group that can be exposed and develop infection for COVID are also supposed to leave from work and then just minimize the transmission of the infection. The other uh, most important uh, strategy for intervention is that just aggressive environmental cleanliness and disinfection has been introduced. Yes, of course, here there are some challenges, specifically there is a trend that, uh, that is already driven from the previous experiences. For example, just spraying is very common here. Yes, of course, uh, our national protocols and resources doesn't recommend this one, but still this is a challenge one. Uh, ventilation through opening windows at healthcare fast is very important one, specifically for those uh, confirmed COVID case, and as well as the TB case, construction and the design of rooms, infectious hazard resource management and others are the, the most key interventions that are supposed to be implemented and have been implemented in regard to reduce the transmission of COVID at healthcare facilities, basically. Uh, there are successes uh, so far. Uh, the, the most important uh, one as COVID response is that, you know, uh, previously I know that uh, one of the challenges in regard to IPC is just the program by itself was, was not uh, dedicated uh, structures at all levels, including at the facility levels, but that's that the, as an opportunity we have got that now IPC is a critical component specifically for pandemics and other public health emergencies and beyond that. Coordination and involvement of stakeholders is very critical and this is one of the response, general understanding towards infection prevention principles. I know that uh, one of the challenges in healthcare fast in, re, in, 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 re, in relation to reduction of the transmission of infection in healthcare facilities that you know the basic understanding how infection can be transmitted from one reservoir or source of infection to another susceptible host but as this time how infection can can be transmitted what are what could be the exposures and what could be the incubation period of the specific transmission of the disease or the infection. I think these are the most important things we have obtained. Behavioral changes towards the critical infection prevention interventions like hand hygiene, PP is very important now. Even they are almost a normal practice at this time. Yes, of course, initially, most of health care files have implemented just as a mandatory hand, hand washing practice, at least as exit and entry specifically at the entry, including face mask utilization, but now just they are almost specifically the hand hygiene practice is becoming now almost a normal practice. This is one of the good and excellent uh, practice in regard to prevention of the COVID response as well as other infections like tuberculosis. Local production of uh, equipment and facilities is also a good experience uh, due to the COVID response, establishment of COVID-19 facilities, more than eight, uh, eight five treatment facilities have been uh, constructed, I, I mean, prepared and developed, more than 334 isolation centers, more than 130 quarantine centers. And in general, IPC wash is the core component of the response. 
uh, we have been implementing uh, the WHO IP support card, which is a monitoring and improvement tool that has been uh, adopted from the WHO. And now at least 300 healthcare facilities have been implementing the monitoring support. This is very, very important tool. They are, the healthcare facilities are supposed to monitor their, their practice in terms of IPC at least at weekly pace, and then they submitted the, their scorecards and then is uh, submitted to the dashboard and then we provided uh, the healthcare facilities the, uh, based on the assessments. Uh, functional EOC emergency operation centers at regional levels and in some areas at uh, zonal or uh, Subsidy labels, updated IP guidelines, and SOPs, availability of risk based guidelines, including algorithms. I will try to show you later about the TV algorithm. Practical experience on emergency preparedness at all levels is one of the good experience and successes. Uh, regarding the TV screening for COVID suspected uh, cases, here I have tried to display. Uh, the Minister of Health has developed an algorithm, just commonly based uh, COVID screening, and then at least it is based on uh, the condition of the case that if already a known TB case, they are supposed to conduct a COVID screening test, conduct household contacts assessment for the TV cases and symptoms and advise all households for TV evaluation as well as treatments, assess the adherence TV treatment and advise or need to contribute TV treatment. If the case is not currently on TV treatment or do not have uh, a TV treatment history, they are supposed to conduct a, a screening for TB, once they are screened, if they are, if they become, or if they are suspected for TB, they are supposed to conduct a COVID testing as per the protocol, and they are supposed to conduct for TB bacteriological tests as per the national guideline, and then register on pre systematic TB book log for follow-up by health extension workers. In here, there are four uh, scenarios. While we screen, while we test, based on the test result, there are three scenarios. Once if TB detected and then COVID not detected, just they are supposed to continue the treatment for the TB infection as per the guideline. And the, the second scenario is that if the result indicates that the TB positive case and as well as COVID positive, that the case is supposed to continue a COVID management as per the protocol, as well as to continue the TB treatment as COVID treatment centers. The third scenario, of if COVID, if COVID is detected but not TB, just we continue to follow for the COVID management as per the protocol. And the fourth scenario is that if the result indicates that neither the case is TB nor COVID-19, just health education will be provided. The other, uh, while we screen, if the in case the TB becomes negative, conduct COVID-19 testing if indicated, and then provide health education on TB and COVID-19. Uh, here I have tried just to see the relation, the correlation between the COVID response related to IPC and the TB new infection rates. As you have seen from the uh, graph, there have been some decrements, specifically before COVID. There were about 2307 new pulmonary TB cases. 
after COVID cases. That means for the last six months, there were almost about 19,897 cases. Uh, there might be a clear and specific reason why the COVID case could be reduced this amount of, but what you could try to see from the experiences and the report from healthcare facilities is that, you know, initially due to the panic for the COVID response, most of, most of the services were uh, restricted and then exempted. Uh, the other reason is that even from the community, as well as from individuals, there were high panic just to visit healthcare facilities and then go to test for, K, for the TV. And insignificantly, I'm not sure that how much it could contribute, but maybe the effective implementation of the infection prevention, specifically as I mentioned earlier, by this time, appropriate wear appropriate of face masks, specifically, Medical mask A95 is very common, and that con that might contribute even to the slowdown or to the reduction of the TB positive case specifically, or uh, if once the infection could be happen within two or uh, one month's incubation period. Otherwise, the service might affect the COVID, uh, I mean the TB case reduction. The challenge so far shift from unnecessary fear panic to negligence is one of the challenges. You know, as, as I earlier mentioned previously, there was a panic, but now on the contrary, there is negligence to COVID-19 because most of the cases are asymptomatic. No acceptance to practice towards new evidence-based recommendations. For example, as I mentioned earlier, to the updated recommendation of environmental inspection, lack of strong IP wash, at, uh, at facilities, shortage of PPEs, inconsistency of TB screening for COVID suspected cases, weak monitoring system, specifically monitoring of health case infection, lack of enforcement towards minimum requirements are some of the challenges. And here I have tried to just mention uh, the way forward this dedicated IP structure is very critical for us. Sustained advocacy about IPC and pandemic still should be the priority and should be continued. Integrated approach with other programs, COVID with TB, TB with other, with HIV, as other related infections should be strengthened, establishing strong surveillance system, particularly health workers infection is very critical. Conduct regular IPC process and outcome measures is very important one. And IPC measures should be monitored at schools following the school reopening and workplace implementation of sustained and integrated COVID and TV prevention should be also strengthened. Uh, thank you so much, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gary, for your presentation. Um, I will welcome Anna Vudran for the Q&A session. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mola, and thank you, Karen, for your presentation. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to ask one or two of the questions. Uh, quite a few of them are similar. Karen, I'm going to direct these to you because it's about the um, TB and patients around what you've done in the presentation. One of the questions was regarding the window for patient safety, that we can't open them 100% for um, the safety, only 30%, what can we do about this? Gordon, over to you. Yeah, I'm not sure what that means. Are we afraid the patients are gonna, this is in high buildings, I'm assuming, uh, that the patients will fall out. I think, you know, if those are your policies, those are your policies, but I would strongly urge redesigning uh, facilities in the future. You can put the windows higher up. Um, and I suppose you could put bars on them um, if the issue is that you don't want patients to fall out. But natural ventilation is absolutely the most important thing to keep in mind, both for obviously TB as well as COVID and other respiratory pathogens and maximizing it is key. 
Thank you, Corin. Yes, I agree. I think if they can just maybe put the bars in, you know, in the inside and then still open the windows completely, that will also help. The second question I'm going to give to you, Mola, um, they ask you what is the major factors, especially IPC measures in IPC for the high number of cases in healthcare workers? Uh, would you repeat, uh, Anna? I couldn't hear you. They're asking what is the major factors that is increasing the high numbers of cases in healthcare workers with COVID-19? Thank you so much. Uh, we could uh, try to explore the reasons behind why health workers becoming infected is that, uh, you know, even we try to see where they are working. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of the health workers that could be exposed uh, have been working at non-COVID facilities. So that could be the reason is that just neglect, some, to some extent negligence might be the reason and contribute because, you know, those health workers uh, assigned to work at uh, treatment facilities are just, they are curious and they are, they are very careful because they are working, they are dealing with COVID cases. But on the contrary, those health workers that have been working at non-health, at non-COVID facilities might just, just the reason why is that negligence might be the reason, and then maybe uh, even the attention, even the attention, <laughs> the support, uh, including the distribution of PP is a little bit just limited to those non-COVID facilities. So this could be the reasons uh, behind. Thank you, Mola. Uh, this one I'm going to direct to the whole panel. Um, they were asking, if there's a possibility that there's a study done between, oh, I see they've been answered. Oh, sorry about that. I see they've already answered that question. They wanted to ask what disinfectants has been effective for the control of SARS-CoV-2 um, infections under environmental control strategies. And that could be anybody on the board or panels. If I can maybe ask Prof Shade or um, Elizabeth, if you can maybe answer on that one. The disinfectants that has been effective. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. I'm actually going to defer to my colleague Anandate. Um, if he is on the line, he is from our global TB branch, and I think can answer that very well. Anand. Anand, are you still with us, Dr. Anand? I see he's still on the line, but maybe he's not hearing us. Oh, he's having trouble unmuting. Uh, okay, yes. Okay, so Anna, can you just um, uh, please repeat the question and I'll do my best uh, while Anand is working on uh, his uh, muting. So I wanted to know what is disinfectant has been effective for the control of SARS-CoV-2 infections under the environmental control strategies? Oh gosh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, bleach at 0.1% has been shown to be effective. Um, it's it's um, not a particularly hardy bug. You don't need the levels that you need for Ebola um, or, any, or C. difficile or any of the uh, stronger bugs. Um, just bleach 0.1% uh, is fine. And that is, you know, easily available and accessible uh, on the continent. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can I open this up also to the panel? They wanted to know how do we um, get behavior change with our healthcare workers? What can we do to do a, create a behavior change for our healthcare workers in the pandemic with TB and with COVID-19? Um, I think behavior change is incredibly complicated and um, it's important. I think you have to open up the discussion with your healthcare staff. You have to figure out why they behave as they do. You have to listen to them uh, and then you have to respond. Um, I think behavior change can happen uh, it depends. Hand washing, hand hygiene, for example, with sanitizer in my hospital took years to get everybody to do it. Um, and there were massive sessions 
Everybody understood what the problems were and why they should do it, but they weren't doing it. Uh, in the end, availability of you know, hand hygiene dispensers contributed as much to behavior change as anything else. So I think behavior change is a very long process. We all have to do it. It's key, um, but you have to listen to what the healthcare workers' focus and concerns are, or you're not going to be able to get them to change. Okay, the next question um, I wanted to also put down, maybe Dr. Anand can answer this one. Uh, the person was wondering how frequently should we disinfect public buses um, and multiple use of vehicles in a protection, particular section or unit? Uh, I don't know, maybe Elizabeth, you want to take that? I mean... Uh... Sure, I can help with that Anand if you want. Yeah. Um, so recommendations vary by um, locale on that. Um, in general, um, they would know. I think you know they wouldn't wanted to know disinfect public buses and multiple use of yeah. vehicles. Yes, I just want to know. And so, but what I'm saying is recommendations vary by locale on how often they should be disinfected. Um, it, we say probably a minimum of once a day for you know. Um, because it's going to be harder to do it more often, you know, even if there are a lot of people coming on and potentially contaminating the environment, it's going to be a lot harder to do it more often than once a day, uh, practically for most uh, public transportation providers. Um, I think, you know, we've already now nearly 25, 20, 30 minutes for Yes, Elizabeth. I'm, I'm sorry, Anna, can you, can you say that? Do you want me to answer the question or, or no? No, no, I think that is, um, I think that is what they've, you know, we could just um, agree on that it depends on country to country. Um, exactly. so like you said, there's at and least one, it depends on, you know, what they least, can do. Yeah. And, and if I, oh, um, if I may say the most important thing really is for the people who are using the transportation to mm -hmm. wear masks, to have the windows <sighs> open as much as possible and then to make sure to clean hands uh, both before and after using such a multiple use, uh, multiple person vehicle. And Anand, I'm sorry, I cut yeah, you no, off. Thanks Elizabeth, I was going to say that more, more important rather than cleaning the buses because even if it is done once in a day, I mean, then it's it's feasibility issue, right? So more important is as you said, Elizabeth, it's like wearing the face covering, cleaning, sanitizing hands, that would be most important, uh, especially in the public setting because I mean, even if you clean it once a day, that might be the most visible one. There is a lot of potential for you one to get infected. So I think just the, the hygiene and then wearing the face covering would be the most effective. Thank you. The last question I want to ask to, to Corin, they've asked, they said a great insightful presentation. They wanted to know, is a multi-drug treatment resistant patient likely or not likely to respond to COVID-19 treatment? Well, tuberculosis is a bacteria and COVID-19 is a virus. So even if you have multi-drug resistant TB, which is difficult enough to treat, um, you should still be able to respond to whatever is believed to be effective treatment for COVID-19. Um, so I think um, that that is, should not be a concern. Uh, what you would worry about is if there's a multi-drug resistant TB case still infectious in your COVID-19 facility, that would be a problem. Um, but hopefully that will not happen. Thank you, Corin. Um, I think we need to stop. It's now 22 um, already. So we've already 10 minutes past our time. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists that um, joined us today. Also, thank you very much, Corin and uh, Mola for your great presentations. Thank you for everybody that joined us. And then thank you for Susan to facilitate this as well. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you to all. <laughs>